Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica, and I'm a JCI Beirut member. Um, I'm the leading on this project for Women Entrepreneurs in Sustainability. And I want to welcome you all today uh, because it is quite a special day. If anyone knows, it marks the International Day for Elimination of Violence uh, Against Women. And uh, before I begin, I would like to introduce JCI for those of you who, don't, who do not know what it is. Um, uh, JCI has one major mission and it is to provide development opportunities that empower young people like us to create positive change. And through that, it, uh, it works on implementing and activating its vision. Uh, the main, main vision of JCI is to be the leading in global network of young active citizens and uh, young enterprising leaders. So back to today, and because it is the, uh, the International Day of Elimination of Violence Against Women, it is important to remember that the, this day marks the beginning of 16 days of uh, remembrance and activism, culminating in the International Day of Human Rights. So what is worrying is that the numbers are, uh, are increasing uh, for the number of women, uh, of violated women. They are staggering and the act itself is spreading a lot. And many studies have shown that women and girls account for approximately 71% of all human trafficking victims, and that up to 70% of women have experienced violence from an intimate partner. Thus, today we are here to help raise awareness and inspire by action to show everyone that only when women are free from the fear of brutality can we start to create a bright future in which every person is treated with respect and dignity. So today in our panel discussion, we are focusing on uh, empowered women, like the speakers that are gonna join uh, after a while. We are shedding the light on these young women who had fears to express themselves at first, but they did anyway. And those who fell down maybe multiples of times, but they managed to rise up again and face whatever difficulties they met and to, in order to achieve their goals eventually. Today, we will be hosting four amazingly accomplished ladies each in her field. And the moderator of our panel discussion will be Dr. Martina Aboud, welcome. Uh, Dr. Martina has uh, completed her PhD at the University of uh, Oxford, and she is the founder of Creo Incubator. Uh, a Creo Incubator garners the power of micro learning and gamification to equip aspiring entrepreneurs with the best skills and know-how to kickstart their journey. Clio Incubator aims to, uh, at making access to business and to business skills and education more equitable and accessible using fun learning methods and community support and mentoring. So in 2019, Dr. Martin was, was this is quite amazing. So Dr. Martin was listed on the Forbes 30 under 30 in science and healthcare. And the floor is yours, Dr. Martin, welcome. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, for the nice introduction and thank you everyone for accommodating with your time and waiting with us as well uh, while the technical issues uh, have been solved. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you today and I'm even more excited uh, to be in a discussion and dialogue with uh, three uh, Creopreneurs specifically, like three amazing women who have graduated from our very own uh, Creo Incubator program, and at the same time also uh, hosting one of the uh, very important uh, JCI uh, members on the international level, uh, Tetiwi and Zima. So uh, I will start first of all by asking the different panelists uh, to introduce themselves. And three to five minutes, and then we will be diving into uh, our different discussions, whereby we will be focusing on two different areas. One is specifically like women in entrepreneurship and how we can overcome the challenges and what are the different ways that uh, this can be achieved, basically. And at the same time, the second and very important component of our discussion today will be focused on sustainability. What is sustainability? How do we understand it? And how do we incorporate it specifically in entrepreneurship and in different startup cultures 
and visions. So uh, let me just start by uh, the introductions on, about the panelists. Rita, we will start with you. Can you please let us know a little bit about yourself and why you're here uh, today in three to five minutes max, please. Yes, thank you, Martin. So hello, everyone. I'm Rita. I'm a chemical engineer. I graduated with honors from USAC in 2019. And since then, I had the opportunity to start building my very first uh, professional career step-by-step -step in the engineering field and specifically in the solid waste management and treatment sector. Because, you know, I studied chemical engineering, so I studied its major and I have this technical background and the academic knowledge, which are really very important and crucial to be able to provide viable and sustainable solution for the waste crisis that you are facing in Lebanon and to be able to work on any type of treatment process. Now, besides my engineering background, I have uh, participated in many entrepreneurship and youth programs. One of them is Creo Incubator, as you know, and really it was honestly one of its kind experience because, you know, at first I had this curiosity to learn more about entrepreneurship, to have this entrepreneurship mindset. And this really helped me a lot. I improved my skills. And now I'm more able to handle any project, not only from a pure uh, technical or engineering uh, background, but, uh, but also from a uh, business perspective. So that's me, brief. Thank you so much, Rita. We will be uh, talking a, a lot more on waste management and how specifically, you know, managing our waste in a sustainable exactly. way can have, you know, major impacts on our environment and on the society as a whole as well. Uh, now I would love for uh, Tetiwi to present yourself, please. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Well, my name's uh, Tetiwi Nzima, all the way from Zambia. And, um, I'm a founder and um, fashion illustrator of a clothing brand called House of Nkosi. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about my name, the name of the company. Nkosi means king. So what House of Nkosi basically does is we provide formal apparel to one-stop shop for uh, all the men looking for off-the-shelf or bespoke um, clothing. Uh, it's a one-stop shop offering where men can flawlessly define their style uh, and their, their, their sense of, uh, of, of style really without having to speak. So their clothing basically speaks for them and they don't have to run around. Um, I think over the years, one of the pains that we have as a country is if it's not overpriced or underpriced, there's too much of everything going around. So we have a unique offering and that's my niche. Talking about my, um, my, my studies, funny to say my first degree is in computing and information sciences. Then I went on to do um, an executive uh, MBA in leadership and wealth creation. But I think the love of fashion is something that's always been with me from uh, a baby, uh, my family growing up now, then my family gets to highlight how I used to talk in a certain way growing up. I'm fortunate that my father noticed that in me at a tender age, and he was able to nurture it to a time that I actually felt the need to step out and start my own business. So I've been in the business for a couple of years. We're still growing. We're still trying to tap on the market. And I'm grateful really that I belong to such an international organization. And the beauty of JCI is the networking so it also gives room and space for my uh, business to grow. So every time that I'm uh, on travel or I'm going out for a Congress or I'm getting to meet new people, it provides those development opportunities for me to, to also grow my business. So it's been great thus far. And that's what I'd have to say for now. Thank you so much for this. I think what really immediately stood out from your journey is that 
you know, the journey is never linear. We might want to think about our, our career as if it is just a linear path, but actually it's not. It involves a lot of, you know, discovering oneself, discovering one's skills and abilities and uh, where they fit and so on. And I love as well that you've brought in the social aspect as well with regard to the family, to the upbringing, to the cultural um, aspirations as well that we will have you know ample of opportunity to discuss uh, later on and how these factors can also influence us as women in entrepreneurship and now i'm going to head over to the second uh, fashion designer uh, in the house as well uh, lamia please hello my name is lamia nasif I'm a fashion designer, technology consultant, and entrepreneur. I started my journey by studying computer science. I headed the IT department of the first uh, investment bank that was established in Lebanon. I then pursued my executive MBA, and I headed uh, back office and middle office uh, departments of several financial institutions before I decided to delve and uh, follow my dream, which is related to the creative field. So I studied uh, fashion design at SMAD and I established my own brand, Lamia Nassif Fashion House. Um, I'm also a co-founder and CTO of uh, Omuma, which is a brand that resells kids wear. And I'm also co-founder of uh, Hope Wears Lebanese, which is a initiative that helps and supports the Lebanese designers uh, throughout fashion runway shows. Thank you so much, uh, Lamia, for this. And I'd like to point out that Umuma was actually uh, like, was born specifically, you know, through the Lebox program uh, at, at Creo. And it was like a very amazing journey to observe with uh, Lamia and uh, Leonie and how this has developed. And we will be talking a lot as well about the fashion industry and the contribution of the fashion industry in waste and sustainability. Uh, so, Maha, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. <laughs> my name is Maha. Uh, first, uh, before I introduce myself, I'd like to thank you, um, uh, Martine, uh, for this uh, nice opportunity. And I'd like to thank as well GCI. Um, I just figured that the beauty of these um, uh, of the incubators or accelerators or these programs that we join is that they connect us with, with each other. So already, uh, let's say me and Lamia and you, we, we know each other, but through Clio and through you, we were able to as well now get connected with other fellows from JCI. And hopefully uh, this connection is gonna develop further as well and to be able to meet other, um, other colleagues as well and entrepreneurs and founders and creatives from different fields. So, um, uh, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I fully agree with this. I think, you know, building networks is one of the most important assets that we can really be looking for and also like developing at the same time. And many times it becomes a bit, you know, difficult and challenging, especially in the past two years with the virtual world and, and the pandemic and so on, like human connections can become a bit more difficult to build your network, you know, in a physical space. And yet it also opens up opportunities with respect to, you know, virtual opportunities really like, like today I'm joining from London and you guys are in Lebanon and uh, I saw someone in the chat saying Morocco, and I'm quite sure others are joining from other parts of the world. So it's really like the beauty of uh, of networks and such events. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, so please go ahead with the introduction, Maha. Yes, uh, so I'm the founder of Spreadly, but before I go into Spreadly and what, what we do, uh, I'd like to, um, to say that I started my, um, I had my bachelor's degree in engineering, so I have a background in engineering. And then I had my master's degree and as well, and I've been working in an engineering company for the past six years. Uh, throughout these six years, or since, or since my graduation, uh, I have different, uh, I have had different uh, sh uh, mindset shifts. So at first it was the engineering, the uh, undergrad degree, and then the graduate, and then my work. And at some point I was willing to pursue a PhD as well in the education and engineering. However, uh, 
um, something happened later, and then we're going to talk about it later in, when it comes to sustainability and food. And I decided to venture into Spreadly. Uh, if, uh, for for my, my Lebanese followers who don't know, Spreadly is a, is a local alternative, is a Lebanese alternative for, uh, for commercial spreads. We produce uh, spreads that are made of natural ingredients, healthy, delicious, convenient, and now uh, I think they are, we can call them sustainable as well. So um, currently we're selling in the Lebanese uh, market through different platforms online, and we're hoping to tap uh, into bigger into the Lebanese market and hopefully into the region. So um, uh, later we're gonna talk about how, how uh, Spreadly and how each one of us, our ventures have helped us to develop further and uh, shift from what we, what we originally started. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Maha. And I can already see commonalities between your journey and Tatiwi's journey as well with respect to uh, the non-linear career. And I'm quite sure many will be, will be sharing uh, this non-linear path as well. Um, as you can see, like, all of you really, we have uh, four amazing women from different back backgrounds and different sectors. And this will allow us to uh, have the conversation about uh, sustainability in all of these different sectors and how we need a more you know, holistic uh, view and approach on sustainability. So by starting the first pillar of our discussion, which is mostly focused on women, specifically in entrepreneurship, I have looked up a few numbers in the last few days, and I would like just to read to you a couple of statistics that we've seen. So basically in 2019, the World Economic Forum published a report that women won't gain equality with men for another 208 years, and that's only in the US. And during the COVID-19 pandemic in the past, you know, year and a half, four times more women than men have actually left the workplace. However, the, the very interesting thing is that according to a BCG report, um, BCG is a consultancy company and they do uh, multiple statistics and consultancy work and so on. So according to a report they published, it shows that women founded companies generated twice as much revenue for every dollar invested in them. So this shows us that even though there are multiple challenges, the issue is not really in the women themselves. So we don't want to be focused, and this is something I don't necessarily like in many programs, whereby the focus is only on like changing the women. We're not really here to change women. We're here to explore the different challenges, to explore the different um, obstacles that might exist in the way, in the hope of changing the, the system, really, and like empowering women in the process. And I personally believe that it's very important to always speak from a place of empowerment rather than a place of disempowerment. So while looking at the different entrepreneurial journeys that you guys have been through. My first question to you would be, what main challenges did you have to overcome? And I'm going to start with you, Lamia. Okay, so before I start talking about uh, my entrepreneurial journey, I wanna talk about the challenges that I faced being a woman in a male dominated uh, field, which is the financial sector mainly, and especially the technical side of it. So you always had, I always had to, uh, I always thought and I felt that I need to prove myself. So um, that was the first challenge uh, that I had to face. Uh, even though I actually worked in the first um, investment bank where I worked, the CEO was very, a pro woman, so he always um, tried to hire and keep positions women because he valued women and he understood that they are more organized, more responsible, uh, more ethical, if you want to say. So, even though 
within this culture, I was still facing the uh, challenges that I had to uh, that I had to deal with just by being a woman. Especially that I headed the IT department, which was constituted by uh, we were they were guys, so there were three men, and they had problems taking um, being led by a woman. So, and even though I tried everything, even dividing the tasks, uh, you know, equally with uh, not being bossy at all. So that was really one uh, challenge that I had to face for several years. Uh, th the second challenge was that I've been told that I am nice. <laughs> if, if it's a, this quality is a bad thing to be, you know, kind and to have empathy or to understand people. You know, it's like you have to have this uh, really thick uh, skin okay. and poker face. I mean, I can have a poker face, but <laughs> but that was also a, a challenge that I had to deal with because you know uh, you go out from university, you have your own personality, and you're suddenly in in this. Uh, uh, field and world and you have this, this responsibility and you have to deal with uh, many different uh, personalities and then someone comes and tell you that you have to be something else than what you are which is also another um, challenge that I had to um, undertake uh, now in uh, in my entrepreneurial journey as a woman it's very hard for you to uh, First, find really the people, the persons that you can actually share your ideas. So because I've tried, uh, I, I was always doing these business plans. I've always had this, you know, side that I want to create something for my own. So um, I've been, you know, having these business plans and ideas and being developed. And you have to find really the people that understand you, um, uh, who you can actually share these ideas with. And being a woman, so when I started really tackling into these um, issues and ideas that I wanted to, to go further before I was able to find the right network, um, I don't want to say the word, but you know what, I'm just going to say it. So I've been harassed by people you, you were actually supposed to trust, like lawyers, for example, you know, just because you are a woman, they, they feel that they have the... Uh, the right to, you know, uh, just say things or verbally or whatever, just because they are in this position. And, uh, you know, and uh, the other part is when I moved into my entrepreneurial journey and in fashion design. So I had to, you know, so I had to deal with suppliers and uh, most of the suppliers, you know, of the material, raw material that, uh, that you need to buy in order for you to create your own collection they are owned by men. And um, I was also faced by several uh, situations where they find themselves, you know, like they give the right for them to just um, be inappropriate just by saying things that, you know, they, they seriously shouldn't be saying. So that, these are the challenges that I uh, really wanted to point uh, about. Uh, mainly, the good thing, as Maha said, she talked about networking, uh, thank God for <laughs> Creo and for, you know, the opportunities that uh, you gave us through these uh, networking, um, because this really puts you in a place where you feel safe, where you are understood, when you feel like you have other people within the same mindset of you, that, you know, the journeys may be different, but you are all in the same um, mind. Yeah, like exactly. So, and even we collaborated through uh, one of the um, first show that we did on Hope Wears Lebanese. So, uh, Spreadly Maha was one of the sponsors in the event. So, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> similar to now, but but unfortunately, there's not many physical attendees. So, uh, most of the jars will be distributed over <laughs> instead of having two for each. We'll we'll have uh, four and five. <laughs> At, at the event at the moment, yes. And, uh, you know, this is amazing, basically, like the, the opportunities, the collaborations that can actually exist. So, Lamia, if I would like to kind of, you know, uh, summarize the different challenges that you have faced, this would be uh, one being in a male dominated industry whereby we don't necessarily uh, see so many women being, uh, you know, as much in like IT, financial sectors, and other equivalent. 
uh, you know, uh, jobs and career paths. And at the same time, being also like labeled under a different category, you're either too nice or you're like too harsh in this case. So trying to find your ground while keeping true your, to yourself. And this is what you were referring to. It's quite important to be part of a community whereby you share the same set of values, because these are the values that you're going to basically use every day in your life. And if your like social, professional, and personal values are not aligned, it's going to become very, very difficult to be yourself and be you know, self-aware of who you are basically within uh, that particular uh, job or career and so far. And the inappropriate behavior, that's also like another aspect to it. And I think as always in many different situations, um, there are different factors that are into play, like age could be one factor, gender could be another factor, social uh, you know, awareness can be another uh, factor, cultural uh, interaction. So there are so many different factors that can contribute to one's journey. So Maha, I would love to hear from you, what were the challenges in your journey? Okay, so um, the, the main challenge that I'd like to talk about I'm not sure if it's, um, we can call it a cultural challenge. I'm not sure how to label it. And I'm not sure, honestly, as well, if it's uh, mainly directed for women or it could be uh, for both genders. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be, you know, like whatever, it, whatever uh, it is that you want to talk about, just go for it. We don't need to label it under any specific category. So the main problem is that um, given that we have, I have already graduated with a, with a bachelor from engineering and had my master's degree and already I occupy a job in the engineering sector. So the main, um, the main uh, comment you hear from whether uh, relatives, siblings, parents, friends sometimes, um, uh, or even sometimes strangers, when I, when I talk with people I, 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 I meet randomly, it's that you're an engineer and when, when you want to talk about your initiative and how much you're happy and you know already you have this product which is very good, we like it, everyone likes it, we're going to sell it. So it's like you are an engineer and you have a certain position and hopefully in a couple of years you could be in a higher position. And now you want to come and tell me <laughs> you, you want to sell some, let's say, peanut butter jars or chocolate jars. <laughs> So uh, this is one challenge. I'm not sure if it's related as well to the Arab world or to the Lebanese culture, or maybe uh, some, uh, some, uh, some other attendees could, could uh, also uh, highlight it. But this is like the main challenge that I have faced. And even till now, even after that the product is proving itself, even that we as a Spreadly, as a brand, we are proving ourselves, we are able to increase uh, our share in the market, uh, I do. We do have the vision, but it seems that some, sometimes people uh, are not able to see your vision and they, they want to undermine um, the product or the brand or your vision or your dream. So they have a problem uh, accepting it. But I think it's mostly related because we as a society, we want to, uh, we're raised to be engineers or doctors or lawyers or a specific, you know, specific professions. We, we, we're, we're entitled for specific professions. So this is like the main challenge that, that uh, I face and I still face. Another challenge is um, uh, it's we're, we're, we're considered as women emotional. So whenever we have a decision that we want to take, um, you, you could be labeled as an emotional person that this decision that you are taking is not very rational. Uh, we, need to, uh, to, we need to slow down, think of it a bit more, knowing that um, when, when you're starting a business or when you're leading a business, you need to be, um, it's not emotional about your business, but you need to have the drive to continue. You need, of course, there's ups and downs. Passion. Yeah, you need to be passionate, to be aggressive. Uh, and it's the, the, the same emotion that made me start Spreadly. It's going to make me continue this thing. So there's no, um, there's no embarrassing. It's not embarrassing to be emotional in some cases. We're not talking about extremes here, but... Uh, uh, at the end, the, you, you have a gut feeling that you need to follow and you're labeled for it sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely, Maha. I think you have touched 
on very, very important points, basically like being boxed into this particular profession or this particular you know, career path that one should be taking because it's safe. It doesn't involve risk. Uh, it is like what you're meant to be doing rather than you know, going out of the box and uh, taking those different risks and exploring the different opportunities that are available out there. And even though you were, you know, proving yourself and you're making a profit and the company is quite profitable and so on, you, you will still be questioned uh, for your choices. So uh, that's that's a very interesting point. And I would like to ask uh, Tetiwi if, if you have had any similar challenges because you have also taken a different career path. Thank you so much, Martin. So I would say, uh, I've had similar challenges, and at this point, I would like to say, I think there are cultural uh, challenges. Um, the issue of choosing to walk away from what's supposed to be a normal career to chasing your dreams. Um, in my case, I had to do it gradually, but it, it was fast-tracked. Um, I had a stable job in a good, in a big institution, but then I saw an opportunity to join uh, entrepreneurs and they were just starting out. So I moved from a pensionable job to a non-pensionable job, finished pensionable job. And for my family, it was, it was, okay, what's this girl thinking? You know, are you okay? How do you move from something that's got security to something that doesn't? But for me, because I knew that one day I wanted to start my own business, I needed to be in an environment where people are starting businesses and growing so that I learned the business environment. I get to have a first-hand experience before stepping out on my own. Mm -hmm. So that's one challenge I had to face. But in it all, I think you need to really recognize who your true support system is. And as long as you just have them have your back, everything else is going to be okay because the majority will speak. But if you're going to focus on the majority, you end up falling on the wayside. Uh, the other challenge I think I've faced is being a female uh, and stepping out to do business is never easy. Mm -hmm. I was also in a male dominated industry. I was in IT, uh, it had its struggles. But even when I left and I did business, my clientele is the male folk and knowing that I stepped out to do my own business uh, from a job that wasn't pensionable, it meant I had no capital, but I had to use what I had. So I was using my IT experience. I was using my um, marketing, my, my love for marketing as well to then be able to build up capital for my business. But even as you build up business and you're trying to scale up, you find that other people will then want to harass you, as, as, as earlier been stated. But you need to stand your ground. You need to know what's right. I think that's where dignity comes in as a woman. You'd rather do things the right way, even if it takes forever. So that's been one of the greatest struggles. Do I still go through them? Yes, I do. Um, does it get any better? No, it doesn't. But... I think the passion for the dream is what keeps me going, really. So, yeah, I think those, those have been my challenges, Chell. Yeah, this is, uh, this is very interesting. And I can see how this resonates uh, with, uh, with different experiences that have been shared as well. And the standing your ground is, uh, is absolutely very, very important at, you know, at every occasion, every uh, turnaround. And this is where um, I feel that, you know, like, again, going back to the support network, which you have mentioned, is like a very crucial factor to have in, in any entrepreneurial journey. And equally in any intrapreneurial journey. So Rita over here is, is working for an organization, but she's very entrepreneurial within that organization's leading her uh, projects and uh, different academic research. And I equally know that working within a corporate has its own uh, challenges as well. So I would love to hear from you, Rita. How did you manage to kind of, you know, bring these two sides of yourself 
uh, into each other and what were the challenges that were faced? Yeah, actually, Martin, you hit directly the point. And my first ever challenge that I faced was actually, it turned out into an opportunity later on, but it was the first project that I had to handle in the waste management sector. And it was related to medical waste. Now, later on, we're going to talk in details about the waste management sector, but it's totally uh, different than the household uh, type of waste. So at this stage, uh, back then when I first started, so my professor was actually currently I'm working with, he proposed to work on this issue of uh, medical waste treatment and to take uh, Lebanon and in a waste treatment facility in the South as a case study. So actually this was really a challenging uh, part for me because it was my first. I had no previous idea about uh, the, the topic. I had uh, no idea about the treatment process and I felt like I need to step into the market, into the field directly where you have already very well experienced people out there. Uh, it's yes, male dominated, but I didn't have this challenge of women and, and men. It was more like into the experience and the expertise uh, uh, age. I was like 23, 24, 23 years old, very young, and yet I had to manage to take a project and to solve the issue. Now, throughout this whole process, uh, I really faced so many issues. First, uh, from a technical side, I had to spend more than four months doing academic research, literature review to know more about this topic. And then when you go to field and you need to do your assessment, you need to implement what you have gathered from your technical research. So you face uh, other operating uh, facilities, other operating entities who are dealing with this operation and you need, you have to face them with evidence and you need to prove uh, the right side, you, what you really uh, worked on, what you really know, your technical. So this is right, this is wrong. And here comes really a big challenge to prove them this and to be like a, a woman handling this project, really you need to do double the effort to, to prove uh, this side. And then actually it went with a good impact because we managed to, uh, to have a full report. We highlighted uh, really the issues going on in this facility. We suggested our solution. And now another challenge is that we had to uh, uh, present this report to the municipality. So this was also my first ever uh, face with how it goes in, in Lebanon, actually the procedure and all of this. But really we had a, a good impact as uh, they got convinced at the end uh, with our, uh, what we proposed and the facility uh, shut it down its operation until uh, implementing the improvement. But I learned that, you know, at each state, either you go further, you challenge yourself, you prove yourself, even if you're gonna do double effort, you're gonna work much more on yourself to prove it. And especially to prove it technically, like, you know, I studied this, this, uh, this topic. So you go it and not just like say a no and stay in your comfort zone because you really need to, to prove uh, this side. You know, this is a really a challenging. Now within, uh, so here is Intera. Uh, so Elita, uh, sorry, if I may interrupt you. What you said just remind me uh, of a quote that I really love, which always say that you always have two choices, either to stop to step forward into growth or to step backward into safety. And you have decided to step forward into growth rather than you know stepping backward into safety. And it does require us a lot to you know go out of our comfort zone many times uh, to explore these different opportunities. And I feel here there is also like a gendered layered uh, issue to it when sometimes even with the same level of knowledge women will need to you know go and dig yeah. deep and be super confident about like every single word we are saying well you can see that uh, um, some men not not i don't want to generalize as well but like some of them and specifically those in the in the business field more, more even less uh, will be more confident and you know taking on the challenges even if they don't necessarily know how and then they will figure it out you know along the way they might even you know delegate it to other people to do and so on so it's quite important i love what you said with respect to you know doing 
double the effort and you know proving ourselves in, in the process as well and you were talking about the entrepreneurial side i'd love to hear more about it yeah actually uh, this is not a, a challenge but i i always hear that you you have the capability why don't you you go out and you initiate your own uh, startup or your own thing but i would really like to highlight being an entrepreneur is really challenging by itself it's a really a hard road to take so what i'm trying to do is that i'm bringing out all the ideas, all the projects, and trying to implement them uh, in in my current uh, role uh, within the organization. And you know, it's like you are proving that you are taking more further and in a more rapid way than just trying to deal with all uh, the extra uh, effort that you need to to do uh, outside by yourself. So having a support uh, system, having you know people around you who will bring the best version out of you. So this is, uh, I, I would like really for all the companies to integrate this sort of, uh, of uh, mindset or this sort of workflow inside their organizations because it will help both the company as well as the employees inside this company. So it might be look challenging uh, from a company part or from the employee, but integrating these two sides is really beneficial for both. So absolutely, absolutely, Rita. Here, I think you're you're tackling a very important point, which is that innovation is dynamic. Innovation yeah. is not static. Basically, if we are too static for too long, then our company is definitely going, you know, to fall behind. And that was the case of many companies that were, you know, like a huge monopolies at some point in time, like Kodak or even BlackBerry. And they they managed to kind of, you know, fall behind because of the lack of innovation. And this can be really, you know, brought forward with entrepreneurs having, you know, th this arm within a company that is always innovating, thinking about new stuff. And even some of the big corporates, you know, like, like Google, for instance, like Google Ads, for instance, was created by an entrepreneur in Google. It wasn't, you know, part of their, of their major strategy. And now, but and now when I said Google, like my phone just turned up because I have my Google Assistant on. So yes, um, totally. I don't want to spend too much more time on the entrepreneurial topic. So I'm gonna make it quick before we move into the sustainability area. If you can just let us know one lesson you have learned in entrepreneurship, what would it be? I'm going to start with you again, Lamia. Just one lesson, a quick one. Networking. Networking uh, is very, very important. And one more lesson, I'm just going to say it quickly, which is um, follow, follow your dream, follow your passion, be curious. So go take dancing lessons, go take you know, music lessons, do whatever you feel like doing because you don't know how and where and when you'll be actually, uh, you know, finding something that you really, really are passionate about and could take you to somewhere. And it also helps you with networking. So that's it. Be open to, to opportunities, basically. And this will lead to your network. That's a great lesson. Thank you, Lamia. Maha. It's persistent. You need to be persistent. And uh, to make use of every opportunity that is uh, presented to you every opportunity every possible opportunity so persistence like being persistent don't let go you'll have your ups and downs but it's very important that you know you keep going and be open to like all the different opportunities because you know you never know when uh, like the next big thing is going to happen uh, Tetiwi. for me it would be be authentic, be you, uh, stick to your lane. It will all come together. So stay focused, know what you want and chase your dream without uh, looking forward, looking, looking on to your neighbor's dream. We all have different dreams, so. Absolutely, so basically being, being very authentic to yourself, to your values and just assume who you are. I love this. Thank you so much. Rita, one lesson from you. Uh, I would say uh, know a little about a lot. You know, being an entrepreneur, self-employed, employed, in whatever phase you are, at some point you find yourself, you need to 
of course master your what you what you know your technical issue your major but you at some point you find yourself needing to have a financial knowledge needing to have uh, social knowledge needing to have hr i don't know design presentation uh, soft skills work on your soft skills as much as you want to work on your hard skills and really grasp this knowledge about everything uh, you will succeed in any field and anything you might face you will have like a little basics to know how to overcome it that's absolutely Rita. this is a very very interesting point that you're actually bringing forward uh and you know like knowing a little bit about everything which kind of goes against uh, my phd because it was like knowing everything <laughs> about like a about very the... <laughs> specific no, you, know, you, you need to master your own major part but you need yeah. you know to have other knowledge and other areas for you to yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, I can see how this fits with entrepreneurship so strongly. Like, you need to understand finance and accounting, and you know, managing people and like HRing. If you need to add a, a member to your team, you need everything. How do you do that? Yeah, yeah, you 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 should have this knowledge, even if you're not like you know, as you said, like the the expert in it. You can always you know hire experts, but you should understand how to communicate with them and work a lot on your interpersonal skills, which we end up calling soft skills, but at the same time they are equally you know very hard and important <laughs> skills to acquire. Totally. So and now I think we we're done with the first part of our conversation, and in the next half an hour. We're going to be more focused on the sustainability topic and of course at the end we will open up the floor to uh, to the audience for any questions that you might have or comments and contributions definitely we would love to hear from you so while while preparing for the sustainability session i did something something that is so basic which is basically look up the definition of sustainability according to the oxford dictionary it goes as follow avoidance of the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance and you can see from this very very basic definition of sustainability and according you know to 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 the world's best dictionary it is like the avoidance of depletion and we see that in in this definition by itself the act is very passive. We're looking at like avoiding something bad from happening rather than thinking proactively about sustainability. And how can we actually incorporate sustainability into our ventures, into our daily life, and into our corporations as well as Rita has previously highlighted. So I would love to learn from our different panelists, because we have different sectors represented here. We have the food and uh, supply chain um, sector with, with Maha. We have the fashion industry with Lamia and Titiwi. And we have the waste management sector with Rita. I would love to, to learn from you how is sustainability incor incorporated in these different sectors? And what are you doing with, with your startup as well? around sustainability. So Lamia, again, I'll start with you. And I would love to learn about you know, uh, the different aspects with Umuma specifically as well. OK. So first of all, I just want to uh, share with you how I came into knowing more about sustainability. So when I started my fashion brand, I discovered a lot of discrepancies in the fashion industry and how things are, be are being done. Uh, so it, it led me to, uh, being the curious that I am, it led me to research more and dig more and find out that there are other people who are actually looking at the same problems that the uh, fast fashion uh, has been causing, uh, which, uh, which led me to know more about sustainability. So what is actually, in order to understand what sustainability is, we need to understand what it encompasses. So it actually, we need to remember that it encompasses three main pillars. So we do have the environment, which is really an important pillar uh, that sustainability do tackle. But there are also two main uh, pillars that it also encompasses, 
which is the social impact and the economical impact. So in order for us to actually have real sustainability being you know, applied in any sector, we need to look at these three main pillars. So environmental, social, and economical impact. Now, how is fashion um, you know, being involved in sustainability? So in order to understand what's happening is fast fashion, you know, uh, that started with uh, the industrial revolution. We had the machines. So this helped us produce more garments, you know, by producing more garments, we're making more uh, profits. So we do have more companies who are willing to, you know, invest in such uh, new uh, innovative uh, technology. And everyone started to create their brands, to create more garments. Uh, the more garments we have, the more profits we have, the more uh, uh, new products we want to um, introduce to, uh, the, to the consumer. So what happened is gradually over the years, this shifted the consumer behavior. So now we are not in a place where we follow trends and we follow colors and we want to buy new things every single month. So what, what happened is that with those big brands of fast fashion, um, they don't have the four collection per year, you know, we usually used to have uh, summer, spring and uh, fall, uh, autumn, you know, we, we, did, we had this really nice way to produce and to present the collections. Now it's like two weeks, you have something new, you have new trends, you have new, and all of this, what's, what's happening in the background is that they are using more resources from the earth. So we are depleting the earth resources, you know, we are dying. So sometimes you, you can see if you go and Google, you know, uh, all the information is, is there. So we, we just need to know what questions to ask. There this, are this kind of reminds me, uh, Lamia, of like a photo of uh, different rivers in China, whereby the river was yes. actually... Exactly. like orange and blue be because of like all the waste and the production from the fashion industry. This, this is exactly what I wanted to talk about is that if you look at the photos from satellites, you can see the different rivers all over, you know, China being dyed with colors, you know, that the trend color from but just by looking at the at these images, which is like crazy, because you know what's happening to the soil, to the ecological system. You know that we are killing plants, we are killing the whole ecosystem. You know we are we're destroying the resources instead of uh, being taking care of what what is. So what's, let me know, what's what's the solution? What's so, the solution for yes, that? The first part. So it's. Um, I, if I start talking, I'm going to take forever. <laughs> so, so the first part, this is, I was just talking about the production. In the production um, phase, we need to start thinking, what are, the, what are the alternatives instead of doing these fast fashion? You have several alternatives. One of them is made to measure. One of them is uh, bespoke. Another one is eco, you know, using a fabric that is... Um, that is eco-friendly. Eco -friendly. Um, we, we do have, because sustainability and it's like a huge umbrella and several things can come underneath, underneath it. So we need to, you can see that big fashion brands are now being more conscious because a lot of consumer are demanding them to be more conscious and they are introducing uh, like little by little these small, you know, sub branch of their brand which says ecosystem, uh, eco-friendly or conscious brand. They are taking a little bit uh, into consideration this part of the uh, environmental uh, part which is not enough to be sustainable, by the way. Shall I continue? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid uh, uh, if we want to talk, you know, about fashion sustainability, it might take, you know, hours yeah. uh, drilling into the topic. And you have definitely raised very, very important points and like a quick overview on uh, what like the fashion industry look like, the amount of waste that is being produced, the negative impact on the environment and how much is, um, it is important to you know, cater for needs. But um, another thing that I would like you to highlight, which, which came in, in a previous conversation we had together, was on the importance of personal responsibility. Uh, what, what can you say on the importance of that? Because 
even if many corporates are going to change, um, it's also important from a consumer perspective to be more uh, conscious about that. So what, what, what can you add to this? Point? Yes. So uh, what, what happened is why are the, the question is, why are this, these big brands actually changing? Because consumers are being aware of the impact of, of this, not only on, uh, on the environment, but also on the social. So what's happening is that because these companies are following uh, their profit, they go to poor countries and they, uh, they uh, yes, exploit um, workers. So if you, if you know about uh, Plaza, uh, Rana Plaza in, in 2013, where these you know, huge center of garment workers collapsed and thousands of garment workers uh, died and perished, unfortunately. So um, this led to something called fashion revolution and the consumers are now starting to be more aware. And this is how we uh, in our uh, role is to actually know what we are buying because a t-shirt doesn't really cost $10 because someone is paying with their life, with their health for this t-shirt to be produced. It really doesn't cost $10. So what we can do is be aware of what we're buying try to you know not follow trends or try to if you want to follow trends fine but you know not throw because everything that i'm buying eventually if i'm just bored from it i just donate it for me just to have a clear conscience because when i'm donating i think of i'm, I'm doing good with with the, these people you know and i go back and I, I buy some more and i you know i declutter my closet again and again but only 10%, statistics say that only 10% of the things that are donated are being used because all of the other, you know, like 80 to 90% is being trashed. incinerated, trashed, landfill. So this is causing more um, waste somewhere around the world. So thinking about donations only is not necessarily the way forward. It's important to change the consumer behavior as well. And at the same time, I know that you are involved in a secondhand uh, uh, baby outfit company, basically, whereby we're, we're looking at you know acquiring secondhand outfits and reselling them, creating like a circular uh, economy, basically, within the uh, the fashion industry so we can definitely talk a lot about you know uh, the, the fashion topic but I would love to have uh, Tetiwi's input on the on the fashion industry and sustainability okay thanks so much Martin um, allow me to say that um, most of the things have been highlighted but just to add on uh, there's been a mention of self-awareness and responsibility um, so I think one of the things that keeps ringing in my mind as I do this fashion business is what is my role in ensuring that I'm a player in the sustainable fashion? I'm not just a player in being one of the top designers or whatever it is, but let me be known um, to be a designer who is also caring for the environment, not only for me, but for the ones that are come in behind me. Um, during COVID, funny to say, I then branched out to another uh, part of the business, which is thrift. And funny that you mention it, that, you know, uh, that, that my colleague here then has a thrift store. So I then got into the thrift business. I'm still doing it. And where the sustainability comes in is if we can all then preach to our consumers to say, look, once you have an old piece of clothing and you want to switch it up, there's very fun ways that we can do it. You, you know, we have uh, lots of pieces that we have from the cuttings of our bespoke and you can pick out something. We, we do up a funny piece or a fun piece for you. And, you know, you remake your, your, your clothing that way. I think those are conversations that need to be held. And those are conversations that needs to be carried uh, on henceforth because uh, in the world, well, my part of the world, I think having a change of clothes every so often seems to be so cool. But when you look at it on the environmental side, is it really the coolest thing to do to keep changing your wardrobe at the expense of the environment? Uh, like has been mentioned, you know, um, a t-shirt will not necessarily cost you $10. 
you'll be amazed to know how much water is, is, is then involved into the production of that t-shirt, how much harm it will then do if you don't then uh, dispose of all the chemicals that go into these productions properly. So we need to then start talking sustainable fashion to our consumers as well. It's not just a way of, oh, they're coming in for new clothes, so we get more money. No, but we have to be more cautious. But so much has been already highlighted, and I think I can't add any more. I think you have added very, very good points. And uh, I really like, you know, what you th said as well with respect to the, to the profit and so on. And um, I have to say that, you know, being in the thrift and the, the, the second hand uh, market is even more difficult than the original one, because like the profit margins are definitely going to be, you know, lower just from a like a business owner perspective. So it, it does require a lot of, you know, social responsibility, again, linking to your previous point, being aligned to one's true self and the true identity, and how we can bring, you know, like business and impact together at the same time and like a social enterprise um, model so that we're conscious of the environment, we're conscious of like ESG in general, environment, social and governance, and at the same time we're contributing to some profit that can make the business itself sustainable at the same time. And all of these considerations are, are quite important to really like bring these different topics together. So thank you so much for, for adding a lot to this area. And Rita, I would love to learn from you about the waste management industry. I know there is a lot that we can do in the way we manage our waste and other, you know, greener and friendlier ways of uh, waste management. What can you tell us about uh, sustainability and waste management? Uh, actually, it's really broad, but, you know, uh, the main uh, point to start with is that sustainability and waste management, it's not like a straight road where you drive and you get to the final target, oh, I had a sustainable system and that's it. Actually, it's more like into a cycle. And when we all think about sustainable waste management, we think about the three R's, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, and we stop here. But this is really a misconception because it starts here. So this is only the first stage of the complete and sustainable uh, waste management life cycle. So if just to give you the basics of a definition of a sustainable waste management, well, it falls under three stages. First is to keep the materials for use as long as possible. This is where the community, us as a responsible citizens, we do reduce, reuse, and recycle, and we should implement these behaviors in our daily life. And stage number two, which is most important, and which as a technical and engineers and companies, we do work our work here, is to extract the materials and energy out of the waste. You know, our waste really is a resource. It's not a waste that should be dumped or, or uh, burned out in, in the environment. It has many resources, materials, and especially energy. Now, the third stage, just to end, is the uh, uh, to decrease as much as possible the amount of waste that you will dispose of in landfill. You know, but prior reaching this stage, we must ensure that our waste uh, that we have on a daily basis, we should extract the materials and energy. And I mean by this, like extracting the recyclables, you know, the plastics, the tin cans, the metals, the glass, and all of this. But the most important part in Lebanon is extracting the organic and the food waste. Because, you know, this is uh, the major problem we are facing in Lebanon. And just to give you some statistics, actually, uh, Lebanon produces daily around 6,500 tons of solid waste. This is produced daily. Now, 55%, around 50 to 55% of this waste is organic and food waste, so more than they have. Only 30% around uh, recyclables, and the left is refused waste or what is going to landfills. So imagine you have around 55% of your uh, uh, daily generated solid waste is organic and food waste, which can be turned into fertilizer and compost. Yeah. But in Lebanon, on, you know, we have like between 2016 and 2019, 
Lebanon imports around for organic fertilizers around 55,000 tons of organic fertilizers. And if we take the average cost of one ton of organic fertilizers, it's around $247. So if you just do a simple math between over these three years, so Lebanon spent around $14 million to import organic fertilizers from While outside. While you're actually producing well, I, the country. <laughs> exactly, more than 55% of our waste is food waste and organic waste. Now, these numbers are retrieved from UN Comtrade. They are published in articles. I didn't create any, but just for you to know how much the, uh, the problem is and how much there's lack in Lebanon, we are really have a resource that should be sustained and should be treated in a sustainable way. You know, there's a very system uh, to uh, say composting system that I've worked on and we implemented actually uh, two of it uh, in, in Lebanon. It's you take your organic food waste, you put it inside a closed reactor, you monitor the reaction and you get the organic fertilizer. So it's not that hard, but it requires the will, it requires uh, you know, to change our habit, our look at waste, it's not waste, it's a resource, actually. And, uh, you know, another type of project you can go for organic waste is like having an anaerobic digestion pilot, which is hopefully we're going to have this pilot by next year, is that you put your organic and food waste inside of this reactor and you will produce fertilizer, you can just put it for your plants on your balcony and at the same time you produce biogas. So you connect it to your gas system, to your kitchen, and really you are recovering the energy and the material out of your waste in one single pilot, you know. Yeah, I can talk yeah, a lot yeah. about the unsustainability issue in Lebanon regarding waste, but we really, it starts within our daily uh, habits. So instead of I don't know, drinking in a, a plastic bottle, throwing away a daily four to five uh, water bottles, just have like a glass, you can refill it later on. Uh, sorting is really simple. You just only need to sort organic waste and everything else is put in on the, any other bag because it's so much easier to retrieve the plastic from the glass, from the metal, but it's really hard to retrieve the food waste when it's mixed with plastic and metal. So, Mm. There's small uh, practices that we really need to highlight and to work on and systems really to recover this materials and this energy from our own uh, waste. So Rita, I think there are like, like amazing gems really in what you're saying with respect to what are the different ways that we can uh, create, you know, basically energy and fertilizers out of waste, which are quite simple. And at the same time, the statistics are, are quite shocking. So yeah. um, I'm, uh, again, we can talk, you know, for a very, very long time about all the different ways and the plans and so on. And I know you are working on very interesting uh, academic research in this field as well that I would have loved to even dive more into. But for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to, to stop at this point and just ask Maha sure. about sustainability in food. And guys, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat. Uh, at, uh, at the end, we're, we're, going to take, uh, we're going to take a couple of questions. So Maha, um, you work in the healthy and sustainable uh, food area. And at the same time, you, you, you're interested in sustainable living and in sustainability in the supply chain. So Maha, tell us more. Okay, so when, when you think about food and sustainability, you might think that these two factors do not relate. But uh, I tend to think of them as duality, which means uh, when you try to sustain uh, or to live a healthy lifestyle or to uh, conduct a, a sustainable living, this will allow you to build the conditions that will allow you and help you to live in a sustainable manner. What does it mean? If you want to incorporate sustainability in your lifestyle, in the food, let's say specifically in the food area, we can look at it from two sides. First, the individualistic, where each one of us has to, uh, has to follow a healthy lifestyle and able to, uh, to sustain it and maintain it on the longer run. And second, 
at the same time, you cannot uh, un individualistically alone, you cannot um, sustain this lifestyle if the tools and the resources are not available to you. So if we're talking about individually, we all know that what we eat or the food that we eat matters. And it's not only because the food choices that we make only matters for our body, but at the same time for the environment, which means that when you're eating processed food, which, is, which comes high on the food chain, the processed food, there are different levels, but they do require a certain energy to produce, which means that it requires certain energy to process, produce, cultivate, and to present it to you. So, uh, which means that uh, more pollution is being generated. What we can do to reduce this, uh, uh, this, this issue, we can, we can eat uh, less, we can avoid high processed food, and we're not talking directly to, to shift directly to fresh fruits and vegetables and legumes. Of course, we can do that, but we can as well eat uh, less processed foods. And when we mention less processed food, it doesn't mean only the, the processing or the production of it is, uh, is, is less. No, we, we have to look at the supply chain from the farmers to the plate. So this is, this is why they, uh, they invented something called organic uh, farming, because you need to look at even at the farming process of whatever you are eating. For example, if we're talking, I'm gonna give a small example and uh, hopefully it's not very biased. <laughs> So if we're talking, let's say, about the production of chocolate spread, I'm going to specifically talk about chocolate because it's what, what, what I'm into. So let's say if the, it's the production of hazelnut, how, how is it being farmed? Is it using a lot of pesticide? Is it uh, chemicals? How it's being, uh, what is the water that we're using? Because, you know, at the end, uh, the pesticide and the chemicals will go later into the water, which, which will go again into our cycle then how it's cultivated, then how it's being uh, stored, how it's being produced, whether it's uh, being uh, produced for uh, specific uh, or for chocolate spread, and then how it's being again stored because you have storage on both sides. So even in the storage process, you have a production of energy because you know you need refrigeration, specific dehumidifiers, and then as well, you need to distribute this product. So this is where as well comes in uh, the factor that we can eat locally. And eat locally, it's not only because uh, you're supporting local farmers or local producers, but at the same time, when you eat local, you're using a product that hasn't traveled much distance. So when you're eating a jar from here produced in Beirut versus eating a jar that is produced in France or Italy, and it's being shipped to Lebanon, um, more energy is associated and more pollution is associated with this product. And then as well, you need to look at the packaging. Um, for example, we, we, can, we can target sustainable packaging. Is the packaging that we are using, is it plastic or is it glass? Is it recyclable? Is it reused? Uh, can we um, repurpose it for different use? So this is the supply chain that we're talking about. And if we look at each state of this supply chain, we're gonna see that there are different factors or different aspects that we can make them more sustainable. Um, and But at the same time, uh, I'd like to highlight something. Um, the reason that uh, we, might say, uh, we might say that um, following a healthy lifestyle is easy or we, we, we are pro for following a healthy lifestyle, but the research shows, and I've, I've endured it myself as well, that 31% of consumers, um, they, uh, they feel guilty every time they consume, let's say, specifically chocolate. And the reason is that these consumers, they look for healthier alternatives. However, the alternatives that they find are not always um, appealing for them. So you might find an alternative, but you don't like it. You could live off it for a, a couple of weeks, but you're not going to keep it in your diet. You're not going to sustain it. So um, it's our job as well as producers to listen to the consumers, what they really want, and provide them with with, with what they really want. Is it only a healthy uh, product or is it a product that is healthy and delicious and, uh, delicious and it appeals to them? So- I, uh, I vote for the latter, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do at yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's the job of the consumer itself to be more aware and more conscious aware, but it's the job as well of, of us to provide them with, with the- With the options, with the, with products, the alternatives. The yeah. 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 So that's they have the the possibility 
yes. of you know pursuing this healthy lifestyle and more sustainable one if they actually wish to do so and i think what you have mentioned with respect to the supply chain is a very very important topic because many times we're 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 like the faster generation right our attention spans are lower we go over instagram tiktok reels etc like everything is so quick when we go to the supermarket, we're like shopping quickly. We want to do everything quickly. We don't necessarily take enough time to like, you know, think about every product. W what is the journey of this product? Is it actually sustainable or, or not? Uh, am I contributing to like a, a good way of living? And we need to think about other aspects, like what regulations, what, uh, what labels or equivalent could make the life of you know, consumers easier in order to spot these different uh, um, products that have kind of been you know, vetted or been verified to be actually better alternatives. So I really love what you said with respect to the local aspect, because this is much easier to, uh, to get a feel of, for instance. Thank you so much, Maha, Lamia, Tetiwi, Rita, for your amazing contributions. Now I am going to open, I'm conscious of time, but I'm going to open the floor for just a couple of questions. Uh, I can already see one question in the chat from Rania. Rania, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? We would love to hear your voice if you're in a position to do so. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, all right. Um, so I was actually, I'm, I'm interested to know if uh, you think that this should be done outside of the form, like when, when it comes to uh, organic, uh, like like having uh, or farmers use organic, but I think it's too much on their shoulders, honestly. I think their situation is not really helpful for them to think of eco, uh, eco-friendly practices, especially that, especially that it, it might be required for them to do them on the farm. Um, I personally don't think that it would be a solution to have them uh, produce their own organic uh, fertilizers. However, uh, I would like to Hege, to inform everyone that I have been doing a survey like for the past uh, two weeks. I'm, I'm someone who studies uh, rural community development and I work in the agricultural field. Uh, so <laughs> not sure how much of a problem that is, but with the dollarization issue, many farmers are being forced to um, uh, to shift into the organic uh, farming because they are no longer able to afford fertilizers. However, I would like to ask Rita specifically if she thinks that uh, producing organic or, or producing organic fertilizers should be done on a farm level or outside, and if there are any, if we are able actually to produce this much or, uh, organic fertilizers in Lebanon. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's my question. Thank you, Rania. Actually, uh, the uh, production of organic fertilizers, it's not the responsibility of the farmers themselves. Actually, I was talking about producing organic fertilizers from food waste, from organic, uh, from your own uh, food waste that is being collected on a daily basis by municipalities, uh, you know, the, and it goes to a treatment, a waste treatment facilities. Now, it's the responsibility of the waste treatment facilities to sort the waste into organic and recyclables and to turn this organic uh, and food waste into fertilizers and then sell this type of fertilizers to farmers. So the, actually, we are providing an alternative product to farmers in a very lower uh, price than the one that they are currently buying that's being imported uh, from the outside. And of course, we cannot cover the whole demand currently in the country, but at least we can contribute to decrease a little bit the percentage of uh, importing this organic uh, waste, uh, this organic fertilizers from the outside and to provide some alternatives, you know. Uh, it's not the responsibility of the farmers, actually it's a kind of solution or to relieve the farmers who can use this type of organic fertilizers and pay less money than uh, the ones that are uh, importing it and paying it now currently and, and dollar currency, you know. It's a solution for our waste crisis, it's not uh, for the farmers uh, themselves, if, if I understand well your question. Yeah, yeah. I just want to add one more thing, honestly. Uh, I think what what we also need to do further is to actually test the the natural for the the, uh, the organic fertilizers. We, we are doing uh, it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We are doing it, and it's quite a good quality to be used for agricultural. You know, it's it's grade B actually a uh, compost and all the uh, codes and norms that to to, to you need to check. Uh, for the agriculture is already uh, uh, done for this type of compost. 
Thank you, Rita. Welcome. All right, uh, thank you so much, Rania, for your question and your uh, comments and contribution as well. We can take one more question. Uh, yes, Rina? If no one else has, if, if no one else has uh, a question, I will, I will be addressing my question to Lamia and Tatiwe specifically, uh, because uh, we know that the fashion industry and the fashion industry, uh, there has been some awareness on conscious consumerism and what the fashion industry, how the fashion industry is impacting uh, nature and uh, the resources on the planet Earth. But there is one thing that is missing from the cycle that a lot of people are still in this vicious cycle of, of buying and, and throwing clothes. And we, we don't really know, as you said, it's not only about the time that these people and the energy that they're putting in to make the clothes, but it's also in the resources. Something, for example, is that one, one pair of jeans might be costing 20 gallons of water, I think. So as, as you, Lamia, with your line and uh, Tetiwe also with your shop, how, what do you do or what are the steps or what extra steps are you doing to raise the awareness on this issue? Shall I go first or Tetiwe, do you want to? I'd recommend that uh, Tetiwe goes first and uh, then you can uh, follow up, Lamia. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I would say conversations around sustainability um, in the fashion arena and letting the consumers know how much harm uh, is actually caused in the production of all these new fancy clothes that everybody that you wants to have and be in, in, in line with or in, your, or, or in fashion, should I say, uh, have started happening and have started increasing. I'll speak for Zambia, I'll speak for Africa. So those are conversations that are now becoming popular. So I would say we're a step closer, we're, we're heading in the right direction. We are um, probably 10, 10 hundred steps forward than we were a couple of years back. However, it doesn't mean that we need to slack as the effects of climate change are hitting us harder uh, than a couple of years ago. So we also need to accelerate the conversations that we have. When it comes to um, it being talked about on a personal level, how are we then creating awareness? I think without much harm and with, with creating a, a balance where you then don't want to scare away your, your consumer or your customer as it may be, conversations are being held on a lighter scale. You know, um, sometimes it's as good as having your most uh, popular consumer uh, sit and wait for their clothing whilst you pick up several conversations of, or, you know, or interesting, you give them interesting chats. So it starts from there that you say, oh, do you know how much goes into the production of this? I feel um, sometimes, so, so you have to be very deliberate and you have to be very creative in how you then pass on the message because you have to, you don't have to sell yourself short. Um, we all have different customers. We all, we all deal with different people. Sometimes you may deal with a, a customer and say, hey, um, I think you need to reduce on your spending. And somebody will just say, you know what? I'm not gonna buy from you. You don't need my money. I'll go elsewhere. But if you then talk to them to say, hey, do you know there's a way that you can sustainably still be in fashion and in tune um, by, making sure that this piece of clothing, you can wear it up, down uh, in, you know, two, three styles and you still be able to, to look great. I think those are conversations that need to be increased. Those are conversations that I personally am having with my clientele and it seems to be working because then people get to see, oh, I don't need to have 10 uh, different t-shirts. I can have one which I can fold or if it's a shirt, I can fold it if it's got buttons, I can pull it up, you know, it can be a three quarter, then can go all the way down into a long sleeve. So we have to be more creative, more deliberate, and we have to create that self-awareness. 
to our consumers as well. So I think that's one area that I've been working on personally. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's a lot of, you know, thinking on your feet and at the same time, you know, by just being in the, involved in this event today, for instance, we're already kind of like raising the awareness about, uh, you know, the importance of, uh, of sustainability and fashion as well. Lamia, would you like to add something quick to this? Yes, I just want to share how I do the production uh, in my uh, brand. Uh, so Lamia Nasif, Nasif Fashion uh, House is actually a mostly made to measure. So what I do is I do prototypes instead of doing several, uh, you know, I don't work with big factories and produce several uh, quantities from the same. I do prototypes. And then when someone uh, orders, uh, so we produce according to the measurements of the client. So we don't have unsold inventory. This is one of uh, two that my packaging is eco-friendly. I never use plastic. I never use something that is, you know, going to waste. Uh, I always use things that are like tote bags, which you can actually uh, reuse afterwards. And I also have an Instagram page, which is uh, called Outfit Hunter LB. And what I do is uh, I try to raise awareness about sustainable fashion there on, on the Instagram uh, because it uh, seems to reach more audience uh, while creating uh, looks using a local uh, designers instead of, you know, um, it's, it's a way to tell people that, you know what, you can go and work with these local designers instead of buying from these brands and trends that would just go. And my pieces are mainly timeless pieces, like this is suit made from by me. <laughs> Love it, by the way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> go for timeless pieces, seasonless pieces that you can actually wear over the years with good quality and that's it. Yeah, absolutely. I can see already in the chat that uh, Maha is offering a 10% discount to all the attendees here today. Uh, from Spreadly, you can use the code and here's the website. I can see that uh, Jessica has also posted uh, uh, Lamia's um, Instagram uh, page, Outfit Hunter. And uh, I'm going also to post uh, our main page to Creo Incubator. Don't hesitate to sign up uh, to our newsletter on the website. Uh, you will get, uh, you know, informations and uh, details about the different uh, programs we open up for women entrepreneurs. We're currently running one, uh, Women Innovators in Africa at the moment, uh, with uh, also in collaboration with the University of Oxford. But at the same time, we open up multiple programs throughout the year. So don't hesitate uh, to sign up and be in touch. And uh, I encourage everybody just to connect over LinkedIn as well. I'm going to post my uh, LinkedIn profile over here, but I invite everybody as well to like post their links if they are interested in doing so and in being connected. Thank you so much to our panelists today. Uh, we have learned a lot from Titiwi on uh, what she's doing with respect to sustainability, but also about her journey, the importance of network and the importance of staying true to one's self and finding one's true uh, north, like, like the proper you know, star and following it kind of. And we've learned a lot uh, from Rita about waste management and what are the, the different methods that we can use on the government level and on the personal level in order to contribute better uh, to, how, to the different ways that waste is managed. We have learned a lot from uh, Maha about uh, the individual, you know, uh, sustainable lifestyle, but also about uh, the supply chain and what are the different steps that a food product can go through. And we've learned a lot from Lamia as well uh, about uh, the fashion industry and the sustainability in the fashion industry, let it be, you know, secondhand or actual productions. Uh, we would like to thank you all on behalf of JCI Lebanon and Creo Incubator for attending the event today. And we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.